All righty. Hello, everybody. I hope everybody's doing well. The title for this teaching is Unseen Hope. The verses that we're going to cover is Romans chapter 8, verses 22 through 25, and Romans chapter 15, verses 1 through 7, and Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. And the date today is August the 8th, 2024. All right, let's get to here. Let's make sure we're good there. And here we go. Stephen. Let's see. Stephen says, hello, family. Hello, Stephen. Oh, you see now here. Let's see if the what I got going on. Our wonderful Miss Valerie comes in. Hello, everyone. Oh, hello, Valerie. Let's see. And as of right now, my computer is working, so I will. Carl, here you go, man. Carl says, hi there, everyone, with a heart. Beautiful, wonderful to see, well, to have all of you here. Those of you that comment, so then I can say hello, and I can share your hello with the rest of our unshakable family. <sighs> Unseen hope. We're still looking at point of focus. This one is perseverance. We talked about perseverance last week. And here we are again. With a little different look on it from what we had last week. Which is usually the case. So... If we jump right into this, we'll just see, because for those of you that have the sheets, this is one page, bigger font, margins aren't as to the edges. Who knows? Who knows what, what this teaching might uh, end up being? Could it be reminiscent of, you know, 2018, where it was closer to 30 minutes <laughs> instead of two hours and you know 20 minutes we'll see time will tell but i do know that however much time it will end up being it's the right amount of time so with that we're going to look at the word perseverance to begin with uh, it is not a word that uh I use in my vocabulary very often. Um, not that I have an extensive uh, vocabulary, but so if we look at what does perseverance mean when we're reading it in the Bible and now specifically dealing with this point of focus, because we have a, a point of focus of Christianity. What does our life look like? How are we seeing the world? How are we reacting to the world? How is it that the world is trying to affect us? And how does how do we persevere? What does what does that interaction look like? Because Christianity, it looks different. And so when our point of focus is where God is telling us to, to be, that's one of the things that separates us from the rest of the world. So we've been talking about this now for, I'll just say, several weeks. Not exactly uh, sure right now, but you know, it's, it's 
been several weeks. And, well, look at that. Christine. Christine comes in and says hi. Wonderful. Let's see here. I'll we'll go on like that. Hi, Christine. Glad you could join. We're talking about perseverance. So what does that mean when we read it in the Bible? From a, Because as we know, a biblical understanding of a word sometimes doesn't line up with a worldly understanding of that word. So with this perseverance, um, steadfastness, well, you know, I use that multiple times a, times a day. <laughs> All right, how about not? Uh, so perseverance would be uh, defined biblically. And the last sentence in here is... Um, Somebody else had said this is how they would define it. I liked it, so I wrote it down. Um, so we have steadfastness, consistency, endurance, patient. The characteristic of a man who is not swerved from his deliberate purpose and his loyalty to faith and piety. If I pause there. Remember, I did. Uh, we talked about piety and piety, godliness. All right. So, um, who is not swerved from his deliberate purpose and his loyalty to faith and piety by even the greatest trials and sufferings, and then the statement of how somebody else defined um, perseverance is standing firm in spite of or regardless of what is going on around you so that's pretty cool that's a that's a good we're gonna persevere we're gonna stand firm in spite of or regardless of whatever's going on around us so if we look at these first few verses, so the book of Romans, we're in the New Testament. The book of Romans, come on, right? Christine says, I like that. See, isn't that, I mean, that it just helps us, I think it helps our brains to better connect with the word. When we read perseverance, we can go, well, okay, fine, yeah, all right. But then we can go, okay, wait a minute. So perseverance, standing firm. Okay. But standing firm in spite of or regardless of what is going on around you. That just helps the brain. Plus, when we read verses that talk about standing firm, then we can take that standing firm and connect it with perseverance as well. And so it even deepens our, our understanding of whatever it is that it is talking about in that. So the first one that we're going to look at is Romans chapter 8, verses 22 through 25. It says, for we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. For in hope we have been saved. 
But hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. So, okay, let's see. So, all of creation is going through these, this groaning, <laughs> right? Carl says, I groan a lot. <laughs> I, yes. I'm not sure how, uh, uh, how much life experience you have, um, Carl, but uh, yeah, it seems like the older we get, or I mean, the the more life experience we get, seems like we have this this more of our body groans and aches and pains. But anyway, um, so it says the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now, and that until now can mean that it was happening and now it's stopped. It's all of this groans and sufferings, the pains of childbirth together until now. But based on the context, the C word, context, I believe that until now is just saying <clears throat> it hasn't stopped. Even up till today, it's still going on because it continues in 23 and it says not only this but we ourselves and then he goes on to explain we have the first fruits of the spirit and yet we still have this groaning And so what is this? Well, this groaning, it says in 23, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons. And what does that mean, Todd? Well, the redemption of our body. So now we have died because we connect with Jesus' death. We can say, I can. I have a legal right of saying that I have died because of my connection with the fact that Christ died. And now I'm born again, because otherwise I wouldn't be able to be born again. If you haven't, if you haven't died, then you're not being born again. That's ain't gonna happen. The one has to happen, and then the next. So now that you're born again, this is saying there's still this, this piece of us that is just eagerly waiting. There's, there's this anticipation of it being completely fulfilled, even though we have it. But it's just, there's there's like an element of it that ourselves are just groaning within ourselves to be able to have that. And that's that adoption as sons, that redemption of our body. We know that we have it. And we have confidence that we have it. And that's where our faith is. And that's. That's where our faith is, and that's where our hope is. But it's unseen hope. We can walk around and we can have confidence that we have this. Our belief is there, our faith 
is there and I can tell you that I can see it because I can walk through situations that should be of a greater concern to me than they are. Right? Stephen says amen. But they're not, and it's not because I'm foolish. It's because I have this confidence because I know that I am a child of God. And that he is my protector and he is my provider. He is the one that goes before me. He is life. So when we have that as our confidence, as our unseen hope, the manifestation of that in our life is just a better life. But in Romans 8, verse 23, it says, having the first fruits of the Spirit, we've got that, we're, we're there, okay? It's not that we're all that, but we have love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, self-control, I believe, are the, the fruits of the Spirit. So our life has those things, And yet we know that there's still more. And so inside, it says, even we ourselves grown within ourselves. We have this this hope that is not seen. I've talked about this before, and I say, you know, if if you want, if you if you hope someday to have this pen. Well, let's say I hope. I hope someday to have this pen. Well, it's kind of foolish if it's sitting in my hands right now. If I have it, I think I'm a little delusional. If my thoughts are, I hope I have this pen sometime. Someday, hopefully, I will be able to use this pen to write with. That it just, that, that's not how hope works. Now, if you have that, and I see that, and I say, man, I sure hope I, ha- I am gifted that pen someday. It's not seen yet, so my hope is there. Okay. So in verse 24, for in hope we have been saved. But hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance so with with standing firm in spite of or regardless of what is going on around you are you standing in perseverance so somebody who is not swerved from their deliberate purpose and their loyalty to faith and godliness, which is what? Jesus. It's his godliness that we get to have. If we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance, we, e- we wait eagerly for it, Standing firm in spite of or regardless of what is going on around us. So, with what I see around me, with what is going on, does that change me? 
Or do I still understand that God loves me? That what Jesus did is enough for me? Do, do I allow the things of the world to change my walk? Or do I change the things of the world by my walk? Now, I will tell you this. It doesn't matter to me if the change happens in the world or not. Because, and I know some of you are like, what? No. The change in the world might happen, might not. It doesn't change my walk. And that's where we get hung up. We look at ourselves. We look at somebody else. We go, hey, brother. Hey, sister. Um, your, your, your walk isn't producing the fruit that it should. Huh. So whose eyes are on the things of the world. What? Stephen, you didn't uh, track with me on that one? It did not translate well? Is that what you're telling me? Let's see. My walk, my Christianity, can change the world. The world should not change my walk in Christianity. Stephen says, walk, produce fruit. It could. One of the things that I, right, Stephen says, but Christ is in us and produces. See, here's the, here's the, the thing that I feel that I am being directed to focus more on. is the first part, not the ripple of it. Too often, we look at the ripple of whatever, right? If I take a rock and I throw it, we throw it in some water, we see the ripple of the water being um, caused by the rock going into the water. The, the ripple happens. So, in Christianity, Jesus is the rock. Now, can Jesus go into the water and not cause a ripple? The answer should be yes. All right, let's see here. Valerie says, we, thank you. Valerie says, yes. All right, so Valerie says, we hope that our walk changes the world, question mark. We shouldn't let the world change ours, question mark. <clears throat> our focus in Christianity is because of what God did, not because of what we have done. It needs to always stay on what God has done as our foundation for life. Because of what God has done. Now that directs my walk. 
Might my walk change the world? Yeah, it might. If my walk changes the world, do I allow that change to affect my walk? I shouldn't. If my walk in Christianity does not change the world, should I let that change my walk? No. Because when I do, now my walk isn't based on what God has done. It's based on the results of what I am doing. Okay, good. All right, so Stephen's like, right, gotcha, bam, right? Um, and Stephen says, mo, I'm guessing he said no. Um, and then Valerie, okay, I understand what you're saying now. Because it's, it's, it's too often we go, well, I can tell by your walk, your, your Christian walk, that you really didn't mean it when you accepted him into your heart. What? What kind of screwed up control manipulation thing you got going on? You just settle your hiney down. Because it's not... Right? You like that one, Stephen? Because that's not very nice of me, Valerie. Is that what you're saying? You're saying that my comment wasn't very nice? <laughs> I'm pretty sure Valerie, because Valerie said that's not very nice. I'm assuming she's basing it off of the when I had said... You know, your walk doesn't show. <laughs> yes. <laughs> when we look at somebody and say, I want to judge you based on the ripples in your life, to determine if you're really a Christian or not. Well, here's the deal. I'm not that kind of Christian. I don't want to be that kind of Christian because that is a copy. That is a counterfeit of Christianity. Because Christianity is what did Jesus do? What did Holy Spirit do? What did God the Father do? And that's what matters. The ripple from them three of doing what they did is where we find life. That's where we are. Because of their action, we, you and I, are a ripple of what they have done. So, if, if I have a ripple, a good ripple, from whatever I do, it's all part of the ripple that comes from what God has done. And I'm not going to control that. Well, Todd, you should uh, walk better and you should talk better and you should do all these things. No. My focus is on understanding the best I can what it means to be a Christian. And the best that I've come up with 
so far is I am my best when I believe that Jesus is enough. Period. What? End of story. Do not pass go. Whatever. From that belief, life happens. Right? Stephen says straight up. Come on. I can be in your life in whatever way that I have the capacity to be in. Maybe, maybe I'm in your life just long enough to acknowledge you in the grocery store. Say hi. Which, you know, it's been a few years now, but not real all that long ago. I really didn't even like to talk to the cashier when they said hello. Because I figured I was going to screw it up. And you should thank God if you have no understanding of, no concept of what I just said. So, when we deal with this, my walk should never be affected by how the world responds, whether negatively or positively, that should not be what's in control of my life. And far too often, it is for people. They go, all right, well, I'm going to do this, and then... I'm going to look around and I'm going to see if what kind of ripples it's creating and then adjust my words, my walk, my, my action based on the ripples. Now, is that a bad way to live? I'll say no, but I will say there's better ways to live. The better way to live is I'm going to do this because that is my understanding of what I should do right now. Might it be different this afternoon, tomorrow, next month, next year? Oh, maybe. Or maybe I'll go 10 steps further. The thing is, my walk is based on my identity. And my identity is who God has created me to be. So we have this unseen hope. Because we have not seen it yet. You go, oh man, Todd, I've, I've seen all sorts of great things. Wonderful. And you're going to see more. It's beautiful how Christianity is. Because we get to see life. We get to interact with life. We just don't get, I'll say, infected by life.
Okay. I think that's enough with Romans 8, don't you? Let's move on, shall we? Stay in the book of Romans, but let's go to chapter 15. So chapter 15, verses 1 through 7. We're, we're probably going to take these verses one at a time. All right, Stephen says, oh yeah, good deal. So the book of Romans, which we're already there, chapter 15, verses 1 through 7, starting with just verse 1. It says, Now we, who are strong, ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength. And not just please ourselves. Hmm. It's kind of weird. Kind of. Uh, I should start lifting more weights apparently then. We should really, you know. Huh. We who are strong. Well, this is not talking about this physical strength. This strong is we have a strong under, uh, correct understanding of our identity. We have this strong, unshakable foundation. that Jesus is enough. It says, we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses, <clears throat> right, Steve, this is right on, ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength. So does that mean that I come on here and I tell you, you suck. You don't know what you're, you, you have created things to do wrong. You are so weak in your understanding that it even surprises me how weak you are. Can you even function right now? How worthless are you on a day-to-day -day basis? Because your strength is not, I mean, you can't even call it anything that's strength because all it is is weakness. See, I mean that, and now, uh, I say it like that because hopefully each one of you can put this into the situation that you have uh, walked through yourself somebody who is stronger, we'll say um, a, a, mature, a mature Christian. Please. Most people that think they're, that they are a, that would describe themselves as a mature Christian, most times they're very mature having themselves be their own God while using Christianity as one of their tools to prove it. He says, no, here, we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength. 
So what does that mean? Put it into, I, I'm hearing, I'm hearing Valerie say, can you say that a different way, please? Okay, let's see if I can say it a different way. Uh, let's see. Now, we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength. Um, we who understand our identity can help walk with those who are struggling to understand their identity. I think that works. Let's see, we're going to flip open the Bible here. Stephen says, makes me think of Galatians 6, 1 through 4. <sighs> Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. It says, brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual... Restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and therefore, uh, bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself, but each one must examine his own work, and then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone and not in regard to another. That's a good connection, Stephen. I like that connection. So we have this, so Romans 15, verse 1, Now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. So if you come to me and talk to me about all of these great and wonderful things, how you understand Christianity and it is this beautiful, wonderful thing, and if I'm not there yet, how much is that helping me? How much is that, how, how good is that for me? It's not, typically. Because most times, when that is done, it's like, look at how great I am. Please, you know what, just get over yourself. Now, it can be done if you go... Well, let's have a conversation. And, you know, here's some of the experiences and here's um, where I got this and have a, a an, an interaction, a conversation. That's what I believe verse one, not just please ourselves. So that whole verse one. So now verse two comes in with, each of us is to please his neighbor for his good, for his neighbor's good. To his edification, to his neighbor's edification. So what? Well, yeah. Here, how about this? I'm going to be in your life for your good to build you up to edify encourage you that's why God had our paths connect you will Todd you know you know, there's a, uh, there's a saying, um, or what is it? Um, in psychology, you're, you're a, uh, giver. 
And so you're going to be surrounded by takers. I know that's not psychology, but but there is that that mentality that I'm just going to give because it says right here, each of us is to please his neighbor for his good to his edification. You can do that as long as you remember verse 1. See, some of you had already forgot what verse 1 said. I separated them out, and in your brain, they're not connected. But they are. Now, we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good to his edification. It's talking about when you're strong in your identity of knowing that Jesus is enough. Your identity as who did God create you to be? What are the free gifts that he has given you? Which is this point of focus that we've been talking about. So now when you have these things, now your walk will, I'll say, be limited, if not will not have any influence by the world. And, you know, sometimes when you're walking this way and you got to kind of go around something, you go, see, Todd, the world influenced you because they put a big old boulder right there. You go, well, you could look at it that way. I didn't. I would look at it and say, nope, God had me going this way, and then he wanted me to go like this, and what he did was he used the world to put a boulder in my way so that I would do that. Otherwise, my focus was to go this way. So if I'm walking this way, this is just the way it's going to be, then, right, yes, <laughs> Stephen's singing the song, Walk This Way. But so so I'm, I'm walking this way, I'm going this way, and then the world happens, and then I go like this and around it. I go up and over it. I go around this way. You go, see? You let the world change your walk. No, I didn't. If I'm walking this way and God's like, this is the way that we should go, son. And then the world comes in and goes, who do you think you are that God would talk to you? Do you really think you're that important to God that he is the one that needs to direct your steps? You know, I have a, a Bible verse that says what you're doing here is not biblical. So whatever it is, if the world, I don't care if the world has a title of pastor, doesn't matter, elder, so what? And Stephen says, we're going straight through. Come on, see? Now that is another option. I'm walking this way and this big old boulder comes down and goes, koosh. There is the option to not go this way, this way, or up and over. It just to go, go right on through it. When that happens, we know that God didn't direct the boulder in to our path, into our life, but the world did. Because if God directed it, then we would have went around it. But since we're just walking through this boulder, like it's not there, but we know that it's there, that's a very good indication that the world is trying to detour our path. So, all right, people.
Let's look. Uh, so we're still in Romans 15. Hopefully you guys are getting something from this. Hopefully this is, uh, I don't know, making some sense to you, that there's some logic to this, that there is some encouragement in this. Uh, Stephen says, like Jesus did. They chased Jesus out to the cliff, but Jesus turned around and walked straight through them, and none of them touched him. Come on. That's right. He's like, nope. This is not going to change the path that I have. That's good. We have Romans chapter 15. We've read verses 1 and 2. So now here, verse 3, it says, For even Christ did not please himself. But as it is written... The reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. And so that's in Psalm. It's referring to Psalm 69.9. And uh, if we just flip there quickly, 68, 69.9. says, for, for zeal your house has consumed me. And the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. The insults that were given to the Father fell on the Son. That's one of the ways with this. The other way we see this is in a marriage, if, and sometimes in, in really good, really, in really good friendships, when one person is insulted, the other person takes that on. So we can look at it and say, we are the bride of Christ. The penalty for our sin has fallen on Christ. He's the one that's going to bear the penalty for us, which now frees us to be able to receive the blessings from God. when we believe that Jesus is enough. Okay, that's verse 3. Verse 4. For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the Scripture, we might have hope. That's a good word. I want to look at verse 5. Verse 5, 5, 6, 5, 6, and 7. We could probably do a teaching just on those three verses. Really good stuff. We are under an hour already, and we're, I'll say, two-thirds of the way through the verses. So I think we're doing a pretty good job time-wise. But it is what it is doesn't really matter as long as you, you, yep, you, are getting something from this, that you can be encouraged by this, that you're able to take this and apply it to your life. So hopefully that stuff is happening. Verse 5 through 7. 
now may the God who gives perseverance. Come on. And encouragement. Grant you to be of the same mind with one another, according to Christ Jesus, so that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, accept one another, just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. Come on, Carl says, I'm encouraged. That is wonderful. Stephen comes in with an all the time. Wonderful. So, verse 5. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement. Oh, Shelly, you little sneaker in, sneaker in you. <laughs> Shelly says, me too! Exclamation points. Wonderful. We sure are blessed to have you part of our unshakable family, Shelly. Come on, right? Carl says, my mind is like Stephen. I'm not sure if I should put the laughy face, the sad face, a heart. <laughs> Oh, Shelly says, I've missed you. We've missed you too, but we know that you tune in whenever you can. So thank you. All right, Stephen tagged Carl saying, you know, one accord and I groan too. See, so uh, with that, as we just dive on a side note just quick here. For Stephen and Carl, the the aches and pains in your body. We speak a release and a relaxing into you. Carl, Stephen, A release of this that is causing the aches, the groaning. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Look at that. Stephen says, my middle name is Carl. LOL. You know what? My middle name is Carlton. That was my dad's name. Next month will be four years since he's passed. Oh, look at that. Shelly says, camp is officially over. Now on to Trace Diaz. Ooh. I won't be seeing you next week, but I'm guessing there will be a time in the future that I will be there. All right, good. Valerie says, amen. Wonderful. All right, Stephen, what is this? All right, Stephen says, neat. All right, so if we get back into this now. Verse 5, now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement. So we sometimes struggle with perseverance. And then you hear the whole, don't ask God for patience because he'll give you situations that you need to be patient for to teach you how to be patient. If that is true, then why is he the God who gives perseverance? I think it's a legitimate question.
God is the one who gives me this perseverance, this standing firm in spite of or regardless of what is going on around you. God gives me that. If I have that, then the world comes at me and gives me situations to say, you don't really believe that God gave you patience, did you? Do you? The world says, oh, see, you really don't have that. You're not good enough to have that. You screwed up just the other day. That disqualifies you. Perseverance says, God said I got it, so I have it. Right? Carl says, thank you. Thank you for the prayers. I'm joyful, though groaning often, and I am patiently waiting my new body. Yahoo! Come on. Ooh, let's see here. Stop it here. Let's see if I can't. And Stephen backs that up with an amen of his own. That for whatever reason, I'm having a hard time with here. There. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> what, Stephen? Stephen says, hang in there. Nine months soon, Pop. Maybe I stepped out for a minute. I'm not... I, I've i lost you, Stephen. I, I, I'm not smelling what you're stepping in. Oh, he's just referring to Romans 8. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Travail. All right, fair enough. Okay. God is the one who gives perseverance and encouragement. God is the one who gives. Verse 5 again. Romans 15, verse 5. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement. That's the first part of verse 5. First half. Um, do you think that would help your walk? And regardless of whether the world... is affected by your walk or not? Knowing that God is the one that gives you perseverance and encouragement? Because here's what happens. I want encouragement by you to let me know that my walk that I am on is good and right and helpful and blah, blah, blah. Because that way then I'll keep going. But if you tell me that it's not, then I'll just stop doing it, even though I really think that God's called me to do that. But if 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 you're not getting out of it what I would hope and want and pray that you would get out of it, then I'm going to stop doing it because obviously I'm not doing it right because you told me that you weren't. Well, I'm sorry, but if God said this is what you should do, that's what you should do. Hopefully that helps you make my comment earlier about your Christianity, your walk in Christianity, whether it creates change or doesn't in the world becomes irrelevant. Because when that's what we're focused on, then that's our foundation. That's our Lord. 
That's our boss because that's what we're focused on. Now, do I hope that you're encouraged by this? Absolutely. And like Carl said earlier, you know, I'm encouraged. Wonderful. Let's see, who gives encouragement? God. Does that mean that I am? Please, get over yourself. No. But when I speak the things that are from heaven, and you receive encouragement by that, it speaks to my sonship. It doesn't speak to me having all that. It speaks to the fact that I'm one of his family members. I am part of the family. So you can be encouraged by the things that you hear in my teachings, and you can tell me that, and I can receive them and not have me boast about it. Because all that you do when you tell me that is you say that you see that I am a child of God. Wonderful. Let's move on, shall we? So it says now, so we're still in verse 5, Romans chapter 15, verse 5. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another. If I just pause right there. Grant you to be of the same mind with one another. Now that's a little scary. You'll look at it and say, well, let's see. We have Stephen and Valerie and Carl and Shelly. And who else? Was there somebody else that said something? Did I miss somebody? Christine. I think that's it. Christine's been quiet. So we have... All of us that have commented, how would you like it to be of the same mind? All six of us. To be of the same mind. I don't know. You're like, man, I don't know. I don't I don't want you in my head. You know, I've been there uh, before. I kind of, you know, I, I'll say I freak some people out sometimes. Um, I haven't done it as much lately because I'm just not around as many people as I used to be. Um, but I can walk up to you, and when I look at you, you know I'm looking past what I can see in the natural and just looking into you know some would say you know into your soul and such and it freaks people out i mean it's just like todd knock it off <laughs> but i do that and i've done that when that's something that is needed for that person it's not for me it's for that other person And then we can go from there. Maybe I give them a, an encouraging word or it's just a matter of knowing that somebody else is there. Whatever it is. <clears throat> but this here is saying that the same God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another... And then to finish it, according to Christ Jesus. So now, instead of being all worried about you're all in my head and you're knowing my thoughts, 
Right. Carl says, a mind that loves to do the will of God, faith in Jesus and loves others. Amen. See, everything, my, my mind rests on the fact that Jesus is enough. That I cannot screw up God's plan because I'm not that important. Eh, I'm very important, but I'm not that powerful that I can screw up his plan. That he loves me. That he directs my steps without me being a puppet or a marionette. There is a lot of freedom there. There is a lot of peace there. There is a lot of rest there. There is zero work there. Right, Stephen agrees with an amen. So now this being of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus. Now we can be of the same mind because now it's not about being in each other's head and, and finding out those deep, dark secrets and figuring out where you hid the double-stuffed Oreos, finding out what you did with whatever. See, there, it, that's not part of it. The connection is according to Christ Jesus. After the resurrection, Jesus. Our born again life. <clears throat> Excuse me. Verse 6 says, so that. <clears throat> what is this? You guys should be of the same mind, so that, verse 6, so that <clears throat> with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So our same mind... Our one voice is speaking about those things that glorify God. It's not the things that glorify you and me. Now, can we do that? Absolutely. I tell you I'm encouraged by you. I receive encouragement from you. I am telling you that I see you as a child of God. I am experiencing you as a member of our family. This is to glorify God because he was the one that did it. You didn't do it. I didn't do it. He was the one that did it. See, that way neither one of us can boast. But when we boast, we boast in what he has done. In us, for us, through us, with us. Our boasting is in his effort not in ours. And yet we still celebrate. You had a good day today? Woohoo! You had a really sucky day today? Let's let's come together. Sometimes hugs really help that. Just knowing that somebody else 
is with you can help that. Well, being of the same mind with one another has that unity. Because this unity isn't that we're all the same and we're one robot and it's just whether you come to to me or to Stephen or to Carl or to Shelly or to Christine or to Valerie that you're going to get the same response, the same thing is just... No, that's not what that means. What that means is the foundation will be the same as long as all of us have the foundation that Christ is enough. What Jesus did is enough, and because of that, now my interaction with you is going to be based on me, and it's going to be based on you. When you have that interaction with another person, if their foundation is Jesus is enough, your interaction with them may very well be different, but when you really look at it, if you were to analyze it, the reaction, the interaction is the same because the same foundation is there. What happens may very well be different because it's different people. Okay, so that's through verse 6. Now verse 7. It begins with therefore, which is just about what most of Romans, each chapter starts with therefore. But this is saying, because of everything that I just said, because of that, accept one another. A C C E P T. Not E X. No, it is A C C E P T. Accept one another. Because of what I just said. just as Jesus also accepted us to the glory of God. See, that's just a big, that's... Well, but Todd, how can we accept one another? Well, let's see, if we go back up, it begins with, now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. That would that be one way of of accepting one another? I think so. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good to his edification. Huh. Let's see, would that be accepting one another? Yeah. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another, according to Christ Jesus, so that with one accord you may, with one voice, Glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, accept one another, just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. Amen. So this unseen hope... Hopefully, this is connecting with you, right? Valerie and Stephen say amen.
Well, we're on to the last set of verses. This one was going to be a whole lot smaller, but, you know, I added some, I'm going to say, controversial verses. And I say controversial because of my belief in what they're saying. Is contrary to what many, I'll say, Christians say this is. Now, I've been saying this for a while, and as of late, so as of maybe the last year, maybe, I've been hearing one person here, one person there, reference something to this effect. So if you've heard this, if, and I'm pretty sure I did, I've done a teaching about this, but we're talking about this unseen hope, this perseverance, this standing firm, persevering, standing firm in spite of or regardless of what is going on around you. Let's go to the last chunk of verses. Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. So right now I'm in the book of Psalms. We're going to go, oh, it's probably, it's at least that, if not more. Okay, yep, there's, that's 1 Corinthians, here's, Galatians, and so just a few pages, Ephesians. So we're going, yep, Ephesians chapter 6. So that's where, that's where we're going right there. Um, in my book, it's 2,689 is where chapter 6 begins. So Ephesians chapter 6 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. So that's just verse 10. Understand, be strong in the Lord. All right, well, how do I do that? Um, well, in the strength of his might. So his strength is your strength. Be strong in your strength that's in his strength. Because your strength is really pretty puny, if we just kind of call it as it is. Okay, now verse, verse 11, I'm just going to read verse 11. I'll read 10 and 11. So it says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. All right. Now, I asked this question this last week. How does this work? Because verse 11 says, put on the full armor of God. Sounds like a whole lot of works to me. Sounds like a whole lot of us doing Put on, you're not getting around that. It says put on the full armor, not just one piece. Put on the full armor of God. And then I'm going to tell you why you should do that. So that you will be able to oh, persevere. What? What? Well, yeah, it says, you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. So how is Christianity, Todd, how, uh, how is Christianity not works, since that's what you've been said saying, come on, Stephen, Stephen says we've been clothed. Come on. But it says, put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm 
against the schemes of the devil. Hmm. Stand firm. Well, if that isn't part of our definition of perseverance, standing firm in spite of whatever's going on. This says stand firm against the schemes of the devil. But how can we put on something and not boast about the fact that, oh, look at this. Hey, you know, look at this breastplate that I put on here. Look at this helmet that I put on here. See my sword? Wouldn't that be boasting? How can we put something on and not have it be works? I'll read verse 12 too. Verse 12 says, For our struggle is not, oh, <laughs> Stephen says, Stand firm makes me think of Braveheart. Hold the line! Right? He says, I'm on the lawn chair, bro. <laughs> that's right. But that's, see, that's, it's a beautiful thing, Stephen, because this stand firm is to persevere. It's perseverance. How can you stand firm and still be in the lawn chair? Because the lawn chair is a great place to be. For some people, that's where they find rest. That's where they find peace. You cannot boast about all of the great things you've done when your boasting is, I sat in a lawn chair. It just doesn't, it just, it, 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 it misses the mark. Okay. Now for verse 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And I will add as a side note there that in the heavenly places would be in the second heavens which you can find in uh, the book of Daniel um, in the Old Testament. But, so it says, here it is. It's like, how is that even possible? <laughs> Carl says, wily e. coyote, wiles of the devil. <laughs> See, and that's, and we go, well, how can we stand firm in that? Stephen says, I call it the unseen puppeteer. Our walk in Christianity, our point of focus in Christianity, does our point of focus change based on what the world I'll say has to offer. It shouldn't. Our point of focus of Christianity has the foundation that Jesus is enough. What he has done, not what we have done or what the world needs. Now, may we have a solution for what the world needs. Yes. Might the world not be ready for it yet? Yes. That's why our walk, our point of focus in Christianity is perseverance as one of the things. 
because we stand firm in the fact that Jesus is enough. So how do we put on this full armor of God? It's an interesting deal. Let's, uh, let's read it, shall we? So I'm going to start in verse 13 now, and we'll see. Maybe I'll get through all of it. But verse 13 says, Therefore, huh, wonder what that's, how about, because of what I just said, now listen, now take note, since I've said all this, therefore, take up. There's another works kind of word. Take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day. And having done everything to stand firm. Verse 14, we'll keep going. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins, or the core of your body, with truth. And having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith, with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. Come on, right? Carl says, believe Jesus has clothed, clothed us with the armor. C-H-S-S. And then he says faith. And C-H-S-S, -S, all capitalized, means or stands for because he said so. I love it. I'm going to put that on there. I love that. Oh, Stephen says, by you mentioning being strong, makes me think of 2 Timothy 2, 1 and 3. Uh, 2 Timothy 2, yep, 1 and 3. All right, we're going to go there, and then, then we're going to cover this armor. Okay, where are we at here? No, we're too far. Ooh, ooh, there we go. Second Timothy, Second Timothy, two. Uh, verse one says, "You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus." Verse three says, um, "Yeah, that one isn't. Verse three is not what we'll have to deal with. But how about this?" So in the Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14 says, Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth. Uh, let's see. In John chapter 14, verse 6, it says, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. 
<laughs> no, Stephen says my spandex with truth. <laughs> oh boy. So so we have this stand firm therefore having girded your loins with truth. What did John 14 6 say? Jesus says I am the truth. So now in our core, so in our center, right? When when you move, move your arms, move your legs, move whatever, your core is what helps you do all of that. The center of you, that's where your power comes from. Your core, you're you're gonna work out, and it's you're gonna work on your core. Right, lying girt. <laughs> All right. Amen, Stephen says. So having girded your loins, having having covered, having put in your core truth. Well, Jesus says, I am truth. And that's in John 14, 6. And then I, it goes and it says, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Well, I mean, we we flip a few more pages, and we go to 1 Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter one verse thirty. But by His doing, you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So now we have stand firm. So persevere, perseverance, standing firm in spite of what we have going on. So verse 14, stand firm, therefore. Well, stand firm because you've girded your loins, your core, with truth, with Jesus. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness, Jesus. Verse 15, having shod your feet. So your feet are, are covered with the preparation of, of the gospel, the too good to be true, good news, of peace. Oh, see, no, that one's a little bit, that's a head scratcher. Um, how about we go into the Old Testament and we say the book of Isaiah is just, it's a very, very cool book. So in the Old Testament, the book of Isaiah, we go to chapter 9 in the book of Isaiah. Read verse 6. It says, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. So that's another description of Jesus. And then we have verse 16. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith. Well, we understand. We understand faith, right? Come on, right? Yes, the Prince of Peace, Stephen says. So when we when we go back into the New Testament, we go into the book of Acts and we go to chapter 3 verse 16 and on the basis of faith in his name it is the name of Jesus which has strengthened this man whom you see and know. And the faith which comes through him, Jesus, has given him the perfect health in the presence of you all. So there's faith. Oh, there's a couple more for faith. Since we're here and all, right, why don't we 
go back into the book of Romans. Because Romans, come on. Yes, yeah, Stephen says, hath made this man strong. You know, we want to stand firm. That's one way to do it. And then we look at Romans 1, verse 17. It says, because we're still talking about faith. It says, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. And since we're here, let's just move on to chapter 3. Romans 3, verses 27 and 28. This one is a pretty big deal when we're talking about putting on the armor of God. Oh, come on. Right? Carl says Ephesians 6, 23. Peace, love, with faith from God the Father and Jesus. <laughs> wow. <laughs> He has the starry-eyed with the heart, and then C, C-H-S-S. -S. Come on, all right, before the Romans, I got to go there. I got to I gotta go check out what he's talking about. Ephesians chapter 6, we just are going through 10 through 18, but Carl goes on to verse 23. Peace be to the brethren, and love with faith, from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Ooh. Verse 24 is kind of cool too. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with uncorruptible love. Ooh. All right. So we're still looking at faith being, what was it? What is that? Taking up the shield of faith. With which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. So this is kind of a big deal. So we've already looked at faith with Acts on 316. And then Romans 117. Now, Romans chapter 3, verses 27 and 28, dealing with taking up the shield of faith. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? Of works? No but by a law of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. You want to talk about having a shield Having a shield of protection, having a shield of faith, which you will be able to extinguish all of the flaming arrows of the evil one. Romans 3, verses 27 and 28. What a great shield of faith. Where is the boasting? Where then is the boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? Of works? No. But by a law of faith. For we maintain that a man. So here. So we maintain. So I hear our perseverance. Our standing firm. We maintain. We stand firm that a person is justified just as if I didn't sin. 
we are justified by faith apart from works of the law. That's one heck of a shield to use. Because those flaming arrows are coming at you. Shoo. And you can try to defend them, knock them out, catch them in the air, right? But God's word says part of the full armor of God is the shield of faith. And this shield of faith says that a person is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Yes, that's right. Stephen says the Iron Dome, right? Where they have all of the dudes that have the... Uh, have the shields, they all get together and they, they build this dome of protection. This feel, this shield of faith. My faith is Jesus is enough, period. That's my shield of faith. Okay, now how about this one? It says, and take the helmet of salvation. Well, that just seems a little goofy. Why have a helmet of salvation? You know why? I did not pull up the verse, but you know why we have a helmet of salvation? Let me let me read Isaiah chapter 43 verse 11. Um, it says, "I even I am the Lord, and there is no savior Besides me. Okay. That, that's that's healthy. That works. And then we go to 2 Timothy. And 2, 2 Timothy. Ooh, Valerie asked to protect our mind. That is, is good. Because what we have is this salvation. Oh, come on, really? Went too far. Second Timothy 1 verse 10. But now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So that's that. And the verse that we started with here at Unshakable, way back when we began, we called this um, SO, S-O-W, which stood for Sunday on Wednesday. This was uh, one of the first verses that we used. Luke chapter 1, verse 77. It says... To give to his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. So we have this helmet of salvation because what Christ did cleanses our conscience. If Somebody does a sacrifice, right? Gives the goat, gives a lamb, ten turtle doves, whatever. As a sacrifice for their sin, well, that worked to a point, but it never cleansed their consciousness of sin. Well, if we understand that we have the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of our sins. Now my conscience has been cleansed of sin and the punishment more, more so, 
the punishment of sin. Now, that activity, that action, is just an action. It doesn't carry the label of sin because the label of sin has the penalty of death. And since you're living your eternal life now, it's kind of hard for you to die if you're living your eternal life, isn't it? So if you can have that penalty for sin, that means that what Jesus did isn't enough, or God lied, or something is just screwed up, and none of that is true, because because what God said is we gain the knowledge of salvation. So if you have an understanding of salvation without having the understanding of the forgiveness of your sins, your understanding of salvation is a counterfeit salvation. Right? Carl says, protect our cleansed conscience from this yeah it it is this um when you put it on your head just like if i when i put on the breastplate of righteousness it is an example that people can relate to back in the day this righteousness protects my heart This helmet of salvation protects my mind, protects my thoughts. Because the world comes at me and says, well, you really screwed that up. You did that wrong. You really missed the mark there. Yeah, you think that what you did is good, but you should have did it yesterday. Don't be so proud of yourself because I've been telling you to do that for the last three years. And you're just finally now getting around to doing it? That's not a win. See, all of those things are the world saying you're not enough. You're not good enough. You're screwed up. You need to do better. You need to be better. Coom, coom, coom. Right, Carl? Carl says, ooh, that's good. Thumbs up. <clears throat> we have the helmet of salvation. It protects our mind. It protects our thoughts because our conscience has been cleansed because it is Jesus and what he has done that has allowed the forgiveness of my sins and it's my sins yesterday today and tomorrow because now my life is not based on my the timeline of my life is not me as the benchmark i live on the timeline of christ and he is the benchmark he's the starting point and I live in the future of when he was here. So do you. Which means my past, my present, and my future is all in, from a timeline standpoint, it's all in the future of when Jesus was here and did what he did that allows for the forgiveness of sins, which then cleanses my conscience of sin so now I can have my Christian walk and not have sin direct my path. It's God's love. My point of focus now does not have sin as part of the equa equation. It's not. That's not how we do this. So in verse 17, take the helmet of salvation 
and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And you'd say, yep, right here, here's the Word of God. And you're not wrong. I like to go, when we're talking about that, I would like to direct our attention to the book of John, chapter 1, verse 1. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All right, well, that's pretty cool. Now we go down to verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. So now that, if we connect that to verse 17 where it says that we are to put on the full armor, that we are to take up the full armor, that we are to stand firm because we have the full armor. Right, Stephen has a bam and amen. So now this full armor, let's see. It says um, you have Jesus in your core. You have Jesus over your heart. You have Jesus in your walk. You have the shield of what Jesus has done for you. You have the protection on your head of Jesus, and you carry the sword of Jesus. So the armor of God is not something you put on like the world puts on armor. Great, Stephen says the spandex of truth. <laughs> This this armor, how we put it on, this is how you put on. This is how you take up. This is how, is there another description? Um, you know, girded, put on, shod, taking up, take all. This is how we do all this. Believe. Have faith that Jesus is enough. And by doing that, you put on the armor of God. Because Christ is the armor of God. If you put it on, you're going to put it on. If you put it on every day, does that mean that you have to take it off at some point? Or when you put it on... Does it lose its potency the longer you wear it? And so then every day when you wake up, then you have to put it on again. So then you better not do any battles at night, which I'm guessing if you're one that puts on the armor every morning, you probably have um, unpleasant dreams because subconsciously you understand that the armor that you put on is now gone and now you're left unprotected. And now you have to put it on again when you wake up. See, Christianity, we put on the armor when we believe that Jesus is enough. Right? That's right. Stephen says it's on at all times, even when I'm down and out. Absolutely. It doesn't matter because Christ is the armor. He tells us he will never leave us nor forsake us. He says that our life is hid in him. He tells us that we are in him and he is in us. So we have protection inside and out, if you want to look at it that way. He is our armor. Now, how does this tie in? I would say that's not seen. So that would be unseen. 
and we can hope that that is true. I believe it is. <laughs> yes. So Stephen says, uh, laying flat on the rock. Sup, family? One accord. <laughs> that's right. So Valerie says, why would you want to take it off? Well, see, that's the that's the the thing you if if you're the one that puts it on, then you would have to take it off because you were the one that put it on. But when we put it on, it's our belief that Jesus did what he said he did, is who he says he is. Jesus is enough. It is our unseen hope. And with all of this in mind, so we have put on the full armor of God. Okay? That's in our heads. We've got this all were, were covered head to toe. Verse 18 says, With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. This prayer can be purposeful and pointed, directed, but prayer is also an open communication. Come on, right? Carl says, whoa, Carl says, uh, Goliath had a lot of armor, but David slung a stone of faith that found its mark. We have God in us, too. Come on. Right? Stephen says, alert! Coffee time. All right. Fair enough. So we have this, yes. See, when, so when, when David went in front of Goliath, he was not saying... I, anything. He was saying, my God is more powerful. He took action not based on the fact that he thought he was anything. And the world was telling him, uh, you're a kid. Go back to tend the sheep. But he's like, well... No. Why would we allow this giant, this Philistine, to stop us from doing anything? His faith, his belief said... This needs to stop. Done. Shoom. Apparently Valerie is in agreement with you, Stephen, about it's coffee time always. All right, people. So with that, this perseverance, standing firm. So when we put on the armor, it says stand firm. Can you see how... Our walk in Christianity is standing firm, not allowing the outside forces to determine the path that we take. It's what God has done that determines our path. Our point of focus has perseverance as one of the points of focus for us because 
of who God is, what he's done, what he said. That allows us to not be swayed, not be pushed around in the winds and the wave, not to be swerved from our purpose and the loyalty to our faith. Just saying. It's a good thing. So with that, hopefully this teaching has been an encouragement for you. I would like to say hello to our wonderful and most darling Sharon on YouTube. Thank you for being a part of our family. I'd like to say hello to Michael and Stephen and Tabitha. Thank you for all you do. Hopefully this teaching has been an encouragement for you. Hopefully there is at least parts of this teaching, if not this teaching as a whole, that you can take, grab a hold of, and apply it to your life right now. So then you can grow in your walk and what that looks like, your point of focus in Christianity to be able to enjoy to a deeper and greater level peace and rest and love joy this goodness that God has for us. All right, everyone. So there you go. Thank you. You have been in a, in a, a great encouragement to me. Thank you for those that share these teachings. Thanks for all the comments. For you all that, that watch this, a great encouragement. Thank you. All the reactions, thanks. Uh, Stephen says, oh yeah, wisdom and an eye-opener. Walk through them, laughy face, right? With peace and joy. I love it. Come on, that's awesome. Miss Valerie, thank you, Pastor O. Good night, everyone. Good night, Valerie. Sleep well. Happy dreams. Have a restful night. All right, with that, I think we should do this again oh, in about a week. Carl says, peace and love to all. I received that, Carl. Thank you. All right, till next time, everyone. <laughs> Bye for now.